All right, competency three, skill five. Graph and interpret a linear equation in real world problems and then use that data to plot points, explain slope and y-intercept, or determine additional solutions. So what does that even mean? Well, when we're given a word problem, we want to identify the graph that represents that situation appropriately. And on the other hand, we can go ahead and solve problems where we're given a graph that represents the problem and we need to identify certain components, such as the y-intercept, the slope, x-intercept, whatever you may have, right? So the best way we can go about this, again, I'm not going to go ahead and give you some tell-all formula because there really isn't. Every situation is different. And so by practicing, that's how you'll get to where you need to be. So let's just start with example one here. The following graph represents the amount of fuel in gallons left in a car as a function of time. Which of the following components of the graph represents when the car will run out of fuel? All right, so let's think about this really quick. Let's think about the context first of all, and then we'll think about what we're trying to solve for, make our plan, and solve. So here's what we got. We got that this graph right here represents the amount of fuel as a function of time. So if we're reading this, I need you to understand that whenever you're representing a function, you're going to know that the amount of fuel, that's going to be your output, okay? Your fuel is your dependent variable, that magical word. I know you're a little confused right now, but that's fine. Amount of fuel, that would be the Y. Amount of fuel left. And thankfully on the GK, they'll, they'll go ahead and label these graphs. I decided not to, to try to help you out in this sense. So the amount of fuel. All right. And then as a function of time, time, it's always your independent variable. This is the time. Okay. And so the question says, which of the following components of the graph represents when the car will run out of fuel? So here's the cool thing about this. We can apply some common sense here. When the car will run out of, will run out of fuel, we'll take a look at our Y. This is the amount of fuel. If we're running out of fuel, or if we have run out of fuel, how much fuel is left? Common sense here. That's zero. We'll have zero fuel left. So if we're looking at this y-axis, we have 40 gallons, 20 gallons, zero gallons. Zero gallons. This is where our car will run out of fuel. So let's think about it. When does this graph hit zero? Well, that's going to be all the way we over there. The actual number? doesn't actually matter here. It really doesn't. What matters is what that value represents. And that's where we cross our x-axis. So remember, this is your x-axis, this is your y-axis. Where the car will run out of fuel, or where the y value is zero, that's where we cross the x-axis, as we see here. Again, where we cross the x-axis. And that is called our x-intercept. I'll go through each and every one of these solutions as well, or these answer choices. Our y-intercept, remember, when we're dealing with linear equations in real world problems, I'm gonna write this over here, y equals mx plus b. The y-intercept is your b, right? And that is your initial value, that's your starting value. So in this situation, that would actually be the amount of fuel that the car has at the beginning of this situation. Answer choice C slope slope would represent how quickly we're running out of fuel so that would be fuel per time or per hour all right and so it says as a function of time it's not specific it could be hours minutes days whatever you have it but we know that the slope would be the fuel per time so it could be miles per gallon or sorry gallons per mile etc things like that the origin, well, that's a distractor answer, and that just represents the coordinate zero, zero, and that actually has really nothing to do with this problem. That's just a simple distractor. Again, A and C are incorrect. B is the correct answer because that's where we will have no fuel, where we run out of fuel, or where we touch that y-axis, or sorry, x-axis, which is called the x-intercept. So... I forgot to mention that for the example one, but here's example two. Go ahead and pause the video and try to solve the problem and then unpause it. That way you can watch me work it out. All right. So Judy would like to save money by opening a bank account. She deposits $150 upon opening the account and then deposits $50, $50 each week thereafter. Which of the following graphs 
represents the value in their savings account as a function of time. All right, so again, this is a linear function, and I wanna make sure that we understand that we're dealing with something like y equals mx plus b, or the equation of the line in slope-intercept form. So, what do each of these components represent? As a reminder, x is your independent variable, y is your dependent, your dependent variable, because y depends on the x. m is your slope, or the rate of change, and b is your y-intercept. So let's talk about this in the sense of a real world problem. We don't have to say slope all the time. We can say rate of change. And I prefer using the term rate of change in real world problems. And same thing for the B, Y intercept. Hey, that's a really technical term. We can say starting value, starting value. All right, understanding that, that's gonna help us out a lot here. So what are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about Judy and she's trying to save up some money. That's pretty much it, that's the context. And what are we trying to solve for? Well, we're trying to identify the graph that represents the value in her savings account. So, well, if we can identify the starting value and the rate of change, we're good to go. So what's our starting value? Well, upon opening the account, she deposited $150. So whatever graph we look at, A, B, C, or D, doesn't matter, we should have an initial value of $150. Well, let's go and take a look. A that's half of 100 that's 50 uh nope c 150 we're good b 150 we're good and d zero mm, she definitely put in 150 dollars when we began so that's also a no so it looks like we're down to c and b now before we even keep it you know before we continue to interpret this problem there's a clear difference between b and c right look at b it's a descending graph it's going down and C is an ascending graph, it's going up. Think about it this way. If you were to go ahead and put money into a savings account and you're putting money in regularly, would you expect the value of the savings account to decline? Absolutely not. You would, you would want to make sure that it grows. So from that common sense little piece there, hey, B isn't an answer, our answer is C, right? But let's pretend we didn't know that. Let's pretend we need to go another route. So deposits $50 each week into a savings account, okay? So what that means is the rate of change is $50 per week. So every week we're adding 50, adding 50. So we would need to see from the start adding 50. So if we go to one, we should see adding 50, something like that. But this is not what we see there in B. So I hope we can see that the answer is C, and that's a pun. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. Their answer is C, all right? And that's because we needed to see an ascending graph starting at the value of 150, all right? And so I'm trying not to laugh right now because I, I just love dad jokes, all right? So example three, go again, go ahead and pause the video. That way you can go ahead. <laughs> all right, so example three. Make sure to pause the video if you'd like to go ahead and solve it before I do. The shown graph represents the toys produced, Y, in thousands of toys by a certain company X hours after the start of business day. Interpret the meaning of the Y-intercept. All right, let's go ahead and take this nice and slow here. Well, remember, Y-intercept in real world contexts, that represents your initial value. That's your initial value, all right? And so let's go ahead and look at the starting value. That's right there, that's at three. Remember, this is in thousands. This is in thousands. So we have three, okay? Automatically, I'm looking at A, the company produces 250 toys per hour. That's a rate, that is not an initial value. A, gone. B, the company produces 3,000 toys per hour. Again, that's a rate, not an initial value. Understanding what y-intercept means is so important. C, at the start of business on this day, the company began with 3,000 toys already built. At the start of business on this day, the company began with three toys already built. So these answers are pretty similar, C and D. What we need to understand is the, the key word here, and it could have been lost while you're reading the problem, but remember that y is being represented in thousands of toys. So if we see three here for the y-intercept, that's three 
thousand. And so I can, I can't guarantee it, but I wouldn't be surprised if a problem like this were on the GK math and it was made with the intention of tricking those who move too quickly. Making sure that you understand that, hey, in thousands of toys, that means we need to go ahead and just take a second look there because it's not three, it's 3,000 toys. And for real, think about it for a second. Do you really think that a toy could produce or would just start off with only three toys uh, at the start of business? You know, if it's, if it's a pretty well-known company or even a half-decent company, it's going to have a couple hundred, if not thousands. And so D is not right. C is the answer. This question depended on your ability to be able to go ahead, understand the problem, and understand some fine print. So nevertheless, you know, good job here. We want to go ahead and keep practicing these skills. Just keep practicing these skills. Use the extra resources that we provide and just make sure you tackle these problems more and more. You're not going to get this exact problem on the GK or possibly anything that's even worded similarly. The wording can be made in so many different ways to represent the same problem. So the only way to really get through this is practice, practice, and practice. So I hope this helps. We're moving on to competency three, skill six next.